Hey there, everyone. Michael A. Bryan here from the Oracular School of Astrology. And today I would like to start a new series here on the Oraculos podcast called Mastering Traditional Astrology. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at not just the constituent elements of traditional astrology, but really the reason why behind those elements. One of the things that we tend to find often within the 21st century is that there are so many people who can describe to us how to do something or the technical background of something, but we don't really see with the same amount of vigor people being able to tell us why things are the way they are. And as we look back into the history of traditional astrology, there are so many people and so many classical astrologers who give us reasons. And I'm thinking about one classical astrologer in particular, Abraham Ibn Ezra, who literally wrote a book of reasons to explain why the various elements of traditional astrology were exactly as they are. Why are there 12 signs of the zodiac and not 13 and not 11? Why do we use four elements in astrology and not three elements and not five? Why do we use seven planets within traditional astrology? And what are the intrinsic qualities of those seven planets? Why do we consider Saturn to be a bad guy? Is there something that really fuels our understanding of why the planets act in the way they do? And this is a really important part of my own approach to astrology. It's a really important part of what we teach at the Oraculo School of Astrology. And I really wanted to give you all the opportunity to step into these teachings with us in a way that makes you feel as if you're also filling some of those places within your own self-education as to why astrology is the way it is so that you could feel more grounded and so that all of us can collectively practice better astrology together. Now, if this is your first time joining us here on the Oraculos podcast, please do take one second, go down below, hit the subscribe button, also hit the notification bell so that you can find out when I release these videos, which is pretty often these days. So you definitely want to stay in the loop for that. And as always, please share this video with your other astrologically and magically minded friends, because I feel as if all of us can benefit from the information that we share here at the Oraculos podcast. Now, before we get into today's episode of Mastering Traditional Astrology, I just want to let you know some upcoming opportunities and events that we have for you to continue to study with us here at Oraculos. First of all, we have our upcoming Horary Astrology Intensive, which is this June 11, 2022. It is our fourth annual Horary Astrology Intensive. So if you've always wanted to study Horary Astrology, or if you've been looking for a means of entering the landscape of traditional approaches to astrology in general, then the Horary Intensive is a wonderful place for you to do it. In the Horary Intensive, we go over not just what is Horary Astrology, but how Horary Astrology can help all of us become even better, clearer, and more concrete astrologers. One of the big things that we do in the Horary Intensive is we dive deeply into the essential dignities and the use of essential dignities and debilities and accidental fortitudes and debilities in traditional astrology, which is something that we are pretty good at here at Oraculos. So if you want to dive into becoming a better, more skillful astrologer, then by all means, feel free to sign up for our upcoming Horary Astrology Intensive, which starts on June 11th. And then after the Horary Intensive, if you haven't had enough of us as your Oraculos family, then please feel free to sign up for our Natal Astrology Intensive. The Natal Astrology Intensive is where I show you all the tools and techniques that we use here at Oraculos to really dive deeply into the heart of traditional astrological natal chart interpretation. And traditional Natal Astrology is a beast all to its own and we do things very differently in traditional astrology than a lot of other schools of astrology are concerned and so if you want to learn how to interpret a natal chart from a traditional astrology perspective 
which deals with not just understanding and clearly describing the psychological constitution of a person, but also clearly describing the concrete events that have occurred within that person's life to make that person exactly who they are, then you definitely want to sign up for our natal astrology intensive as well. And the Natal Astrology Intensive starts on July 23rd, right after our Horary Astrology Intensive. And you can sign up for both of these intensives by checking out our website at www.oraculosastrology.com forward slash programs and sign up for those intensives today. Last but not least, we have our upcoming Foundations of Classical Astrology course. The Foundations of Classical Astrology, or FOCA as we call it at Oraculos, is the beginning of our two-year Excellence in Astrology program, where we teach you everything you need to know to enter the world and be a professional practicing astrologer. And every single thing that I can think of sharing with anyone, we share it there in the Foundations of Classical Astrology, because if you have the Foundations of Classical Astrology firmly under your belt, then you pretty much have the key to the kingdom of all astrology. In FOCO, we teach you not just how to look at one particular style of astrology, but we teach you the foundational elements that constitute all the branches of astrology from a traditional astrological perspective. So if you have always wanted to not only receive professional training to become an astrologer, but if you've also wanted to mobilize your love of astrology by giving good, clear, and concrete readings to people, then by all means, please sign up for our Foundations of Classical Astrology program, which begins this coming fall 2022. It is a wonderful program, and we definitely would love to have all of you join us and become a part of our Oraculos family. So without further ado, let us dive into part one of our Mastering Traditional Astrology series. In this episode, we're going to be diving into the planets, because so much of traditional astrology is planet-focused as opposed to a lot of modern astrology that tends to be signs of the zodiac focused. So our very first deep dive today is going to be into an understanding of the planets through the lens of traditional astrology, and more specifically through the lens of Claudius Ptolemy, who is the author of the Tetra Biblos. In this episode, we'll describe the intrinsic natures of the planets, what makes the planets exactly what they are from Ptolemy's perspective, and how we can use that knowledge to further enrich our entire lives as classical astrologers. So, do enjoy. Today we're going to talk about the seven classical planets and how the seven classical planets derive their nature within a traditional astrological context. So here on the screen, we have what is known as the Chaldean order of the planets. And the Chaldean order is called the Chaldean order because it is attributed to the ancient Babylonians, Chaldea being a name for that region of ancient Babylon. And so this Chaldean order is how the ancients perceived the universe to be built. And it's a radically reduced version of a larger model. But for our purposes today, this is really where our notion of classical astrology begins from an understanding of this Chaldean order. Here, what we find is that there are concentric rings, and these concentric rings were thought to be the rings of the various components of the universe as they circled on our earth in the center. Now, the reason why there was this notion that the earth stood in the center of everything is because from our perspective here on earth, when we look out at the universe, everything does seem as if it's circling our planet. And so we call this perspective a geocentric perspective. And geocentric means exactly what it sounds like. We are centering on our Earth. And similarly, a heliocentric perspective, one in which we center the sun as being the center of our universe, would be called a heliocentric perspective. Helios 
being a god of the sun and therefore heliocentric, meaning the sun is in the center of the universe. And from an astrological perspective, these two notions of heliocentric and geocentric tend to be something that we can go back and forth between. Because in this model that we're looking at on the screen, we have the mundane world or our earth in the center of the universe. However, we have the sun standing in the center of the planets. We have three planets above the sun known as the superior planets, and we have two planets below the sun known as the inferior planets. And we know that the moon herself isn't actually a planet, but the moon is a satellite of the earth. So when we look at things from a geocentric perspective, we still have the sun in the center of the planets, but we have the earth standing in the center of the entire model. And similarly, if we were to swap this and place the earth in the center of the planet and the sun in the center of the universe, then we would still have the same thing, whereas we have three planets above the earth being the superior planets, two planets below the earth being the inferior planets. And as always, the moon, as we know, is not a planet, but the moon is a satellite. And within a geocentric model, then the moon would be the closest thing to our earth. And then we'd build out our Venus and Mercury following the moon. But either way, the point is, in both those models, we still have this celestial body, whether we call it the sun, whether we call it the earth, we still have this standing in the center of a group of three planets on either side. So for all intents and purposes, when we speak about astrology, we tend to speak about it from a geocentric perspective because geocentrism allows us to orient ourselves to our universe based on where we are on earth below. And that's really the point of it. Geocentrism allows us to orient ourselves to the universe around us based on where we are on earth below. And that's one of the core tenets of our astrology. This notion that in order for astrology to make sense and to give cosmic commentary, as it were, to our physical earth-based experience, then we actually have to practice an astrology that centers our perspective that we have on earth, because we can't actually practice an astrology that centers the perspective that we would have on Mars, because we're not on Mars. Similarly, we can't practice an astrology that centers our perspective as if we were on Saturn or Jupiter, because we're not on Saturn or Jupiter. So the chief and foundational tenet of classical astrology from a classical perspective and also of our understanding of classical astrology from our current perspective looking towards the past is that it must by necessity be geocentric because our understanding of the universe around us is similarly geocentric. So that's the first thing. Now, within this geocentric model, we look out at the universe. We have to remember that this is an ancient model of the universe as perceived by the ancients. And so when we look out at the universe from our geocentric perspective, the furthest wandering star that we can see is Saturn followed by Jupiter, followed by Mars, followed by the Sun, followed by Venus, followed by Mercury, followed by the Moon. Now, this notion of wandering star in relationship to the actual planet is built into the actual name planet, because planet comes from the Greek phrase of planetes asteres, or something to that effect. Planet comes from a phrase that means wandering stars. Because to the ancients, as they looked up at their seemingly static night sky, they noticed that there were these pinpricks of light that moved across that static sea of stars. And those pinpricks of light became known as 
the planets. And so even though the sun and the moon, as we know them, aren't actually planets, they are luminaries, insofar as they seem to wander across a changeless sky, then both the sun and the moon also fit within this larger category of being planets themselves. Now, this notion of planet is different from our notion of the fixed stars, because the fixed stars, as we know, characteristic of their nature is that they're fixed. They don't actually move. That is part and parcel of our understanding of the fixed stars, that they're not actually moving in a perceptible way, in the same way as we even notice Saturn, the slowest moving of the seven classical planets moving. So even Saturn, which is taking approximately 29 and a half years to make one full journey through the 12 signs of the zodiac, even Saturn is seeming to have a movement that is perceptible when compared to the fixed stars that don't actually seem to move at all. So that is why the fixed stars were thought to come beyond Saturn in an eighth shell of heaven that goes beyond the actual moving stars, i.e. the planets. And even beyond the fixed stars, we find the realm of the primum mobile. Now, primum mobile is Latin for prime mover. And this notion of the prime mover is an important one in classical astrology, because in classical astrology, our understanding is that beyond the realm of the fixed stars is actually a force within the cosmos that causes the entire cosmos to turn into motion, that causes the entire sky, as it were, the entire vault of heaven to rise in the east and set in the west on a daily basis. But this prima mobile is also what gives the wandering stars or the planets their individual motion in their individual courses across the heavens. So we know, astrologically speaking, that there is this micro daily motion that occurs where everything within the sky seems to rise in the east and set in the west based on wherever we are on earth. And we also know that there is a slower motion that's occurring within all of the planets individually, where they are all making their own journeys across the backdrop of the fixed stars. So there are two motions that we're referring to. Primary motion, which is the rising of the sky in the east and the setting of everything in the sky in the west. And then there's also secondary motion or zodiacal motion, which is the movement of the planets against the backdrop of the fixed stars. So that's our understanding of the mechanism that sets the universe into motion from a classical astrology perspective. Now, stepping down into the actual planets themselves, we kind of want to know what causes the planets to have their natures. Because this question and this understanding of what causes the individual planets to have their individual natures is really the core of how classical astrology builds itself and fleshes itself out because we find that all of our classical astrological language really is derived from an understanding of the intrinsic natures of the seven classical planets. Now you'll notice that I keep on referencing the seven classical planets, and a part of that is because from a traditional astrology perspective, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, and anything else that might be out there, don't actually fit within the structure of a traditional understanding of the philosophy of astrology. Now, I'm not saying that they don't actually fit into astrology in general, because for me, at least, I consider myself to be a neoclassical astrologer. And similarly, I consider myself to teach my students neoclassical astrology. And I think the only thing that probably makes our 
astrology neoclassical as opposed to just being purely classical or traditional is the fact that we do incorporate Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto into our astrology because we found on thousands of occasions that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto do have a material effect within the practice and the study of concrete astrology. So while we use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto because we find them to be important from an astrological perspective, we don't actually include them in the telling of the story of the reasons why traditional astrology is built in the way that it's built, because they never were a factor from a traditional astrological perspective, which is a very important thing for us to bear in mind as we navigate this journey of mastering traditional astrology together. A big part of that mastery is knowing how different concepts apply and where different concepts belong, and also knowing that not every concept that we hold within a modern astrological perspective actually belongs in traditional astrology, because the way that traditional astrology is built is so complete and so perfect within itself as to be, in a sense, hermetically sealed. When we speak about something being hermetically sealed, we speak about something being closed in such a way, whereas it cannot be opened. And the philosophy and the philosophical framework upon which traditional astrology is built is just that. It's closed in a way where it can't actually be opened, but it doesn't change the fact that beyond that philosophy, when we root ourselves in a 21st century practice of astrology, there are many other concepts that we can bring into our traditional understanding of astrology still without uprooting the foundations upon which that astrology is built. So what I'm proposing is that we allow the philosophies of traditional astrology to remain exactly what they are, while still using some of the gifts of modernity, such as Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, as well as so many other things that we find useful and valuable within a modern astrological framework. Now, caveat, this does not mean that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto rule signs of the zodiac, which is a notion that no one within the oraculos astrology family of astrologers believes. So we are not saying at all that Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto rule signs of the zodiac, which is an absolutely modern astrological atrocity, because it doesn't actually make that claim based on an understanding of how and what traditional astrology actually is. And I think that one of the difficulties that we find within this juxtaposition of modern astrology versus traditional astrology is that we speak about them as if they're two distinctly different things. But the path of the <laughs> development of things is that modern astrology ultimately did develop from the basis and from the fundament that traditional astrology provided. And the development shouldn't really be that much different from the place where it's coming from, especially if the place where it's coming from is still vital and still useful. And so the notion of the modern planet of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto ruling signs of the zodiac is a big degradation of our traditional astrological philosophy. And the part of that is because people don't know what that philosophy is to begin with. And so today, my hope is that we can clarify just that piece and how that philosophy of the seven classical planets can help us navigate our own astrological practice with more stability and ease. Here we have our Chaldean order. And we see that the Chaldean order is Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, Moon. And every single person who is an astrologer should know it just like that. 
Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the moon. And even if you're not an astrologer, but you practice something that is tangentially related to astrology, such as the Kabbalistic tarot, such as chiromancy or palmistry, uh, such as geomancy, you should know Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, moon, because all of those subjects also have a very strong astrological influence. So that's our Chaldean order. We have Saturn at the furthest reaches of space, and we actually have the moon bordering on what we call the mundane world. And with the moon bordering on the mundane world, we have the establishment of what is known as the sublunary sphere. Now, this notion of the sublunary sphere is something that we find within ancient Greek astronomy, where everything beneath the moon was thought to be sublunar. And since we're the only ones beneath the moon, that means that our mundane world, our tiny world of matter, our earth down below, essentially is what constitutes the sublunary sphere. So that is the first thing for us to know, that our mundane world is known as the sublunary sphere, or rather our mundane world is within the sublunary sphere of operations, because according to the ancients, all of the influences of the universe and of the other planets are given to us by way of the moon or by the power of the moon which is a part of why the moon is thought to be such an important factor within all astrology, I dare say, because the moon, through the sublunary sphere, filters down to us here on Earth below all of the specific nutrients and things that we need from all of the other planets in order to allow us to have a concrete universe in which we can call our home. So, that is the role of the moon and also of the sublunary sphere, which is essentially named after the moon. And as we go outward, we've already mentioned the sun is essentially standing in the middle of this entire order with three planets above and three planets below, while we have the earth standing in the middle of the universe in general from a geocentric perspective. Now, at the furthest reaches of space, we have Saturn. And Saturn is the furthest planet that the ancients could perceive based on their limited access to advanced technology. And so today, we have technology that allows us to see beyond the threshold that Saturn guards. And with those advances in technology, we found Uranus, we found Neptune, we found Pluto, and we found an entire Kuiper belt of other planetoids and planetary bodies that represent a whole new world of things that orbit our individual star that we call the sun. However, the ancients built their astrology under the awareness that Saturn was the furthest physical planet that had a physical impact on us here below. And because Saturn was the furthest planet, the ancients thought that Saturn's characteristics came from his location in space. Now, bringing it back home for a bit, the sun and the moon have always been thought to be givers and guardians of life. The sun, as we know, is a universal source of heat. And the moon, by virtue of her relationship to the earth, is thought to have some ruling over moisture. So the ancients perceived the sun as being hot and dry because the sun is the universal source of both fire and heat. And the ancients also considered the moon to consist primarily of moisture by virtue of her relationship to our planet Earth and because of the ways in which we notice that the moon through her operations has a direct impact on the waters of our planet Earth. The second characteristic that the ancients thought the moon contained was also heat because she derived that heat based on her relationship to the sun from whom she got the ability 
to have light. So the sun was considered to be hot and dry and the moon was considered to be hot and moist or rather primarily moistening and secondarily heating by virtue of her relationship to the sun. When I speak about the ancients at this moment, I'm primarily speaking about Claudius Ptolemy, who in his book, the Tetra Biblos, in speaking to us about the natures of the planetary orbs, starts to define what the natures of the various planetary orbs are based on their relationships to the sun and the moon. Therefore, if the moon and the earth or rather the moon-earth continuum represented the source of moisture within the universe, and the sun represented a source of heat and dryness within the universe, then all of the other planets would essentially derive their natures based on their proximity to the sun as well as to the moon and earth. So Saturn in the Chaldean order, being furthest from the sun, was thought to be devoid of heat. Therefore, Saturn was thought to be a cold planet. However, Saturn is also as far from the moon and earth as is possible. And if the moon and the earth are sources of moisture, therefore Saturn was also thought to be not only a cold planet, but also a dry planet. So we find ourselves coming into an awareness of the two primary characteristics that Ptolemy in his Tetra Biblos and the ancients in general held as being true about Saturn, that Saturn was both a cold and a dry planet, and intemperately so. And it's that word intemperate that causes Saturn to be considered not the best player in terms of the planets in general. And we'll come to the notion of what we mean by Saturn not being the best player in terms of the planets in general a little later on. But essentially, Saturn was thought to be a destroyer of human life by virtue of the fact that he was intemperately cold and intemperately dry and didn't really have any of the constituent elements necessary to cause anyone to have a good time if they were to go out and visit the planet of Saturn. As we read Ptolemy's Tetra Biblos, the next planet that really comes into effect is the planet Mars. And the reason why Mars is the next planet is because through an understanding of Saturn and an understanding of Mars, we come to understand why the nature of Jupiter is as it is. So in Ptolemy's Tetra Biblos, he tells us that Mars was considered to be intemperately hot and intemperately dry. And the reason for this was because Mars was directly above the orb of the sun from a geocentric perspective. And therefore, by virtue of his proximity to the sun, we would expect for Mars to appropriate unto himself some of the characteristics of the sun, if not all of the characteristics of the sun. And those characteristics were the heating and dryness that are the two characteristics that are primarily located in the sun. However, there's another thing about Mars that makes Mars this intemperately hot planet, and that is the color of Mars himself. When we read through the literature of not only the medieval period, but also the Renaissance, we find Mars being described by different names as a result of his color. For example, we have William Ramsey, writing in the 17th century, saying to us that Mars's color is a bright and shining red like blood because he's a planet associated with slaughter. We find authors earlier within the medieval period also describing Mars as being red like the color of fire and warfare, both of which are under his nature. And so the redness of Mars already associated him within the consciousness of the classical astrologer as being a planet that was destructive, 
as being a planet that operated his destruction through fire, and as being a planet that fundamentally, like Saturn, was not a supporter of human life. Now, as I think about this Sun and Mars scenario, the ancients didn't necessarily find the Sun to be of the same nature as Mars, even though the Sun is the primary source of heat and dryness within the universe. We find Guido Bonatti saying to us in the 13th century that the Sun stands regally within the full force of his power. And the sun stands as a point of harmony within the universe and as a king because he stands in the center of these six planets. So we can't really expect the king to also be the destroyer of his kingdom. Therefore, even though the sun is that much more powerful than Mars in terms of heat and dryness, the sun holds himself with moderation, and the sun holds himself in a regal, upright manner, because the sun knows that the entire life of everything within the universe depends on him holding himself in that way. Whereas Mars, we can compare to a rogue warrior, or Mars, we can compare to a soldier in a sense, where he is still very hot under the collar, and he still has war within his blood, and he still has villages he wants to burn down and places he wants to pillage, and he still has this urge, this angst, this youthfulness, and this inability to hold himself in the same regal manner that the sun holds himself as being the king of our universe. So Mars was considered to be a destroyer of life in general, very similar to Saturn by virtue of not just his color, but also by virtue of his proximity to the sun. Now, Jupiter that stands between both Mars and Saturn was thought to appropriate unto himself the nature of Mars as well as the nature of Saturn in a sense. Jupiter within this Chaldean order, is standing above the double burner of both Mars and the Sun. And by virtue of standing directly above that double burner of Mars and the Sun, we can imagine that the heat and the radiance of Mars and the Sun are filling Jupiter from below. So we have Jupiter essentially drawing onto himself by virtue of his location within the Chaldean order, this hotness or rather this heat from both Mars and the sun, which is causing Jupiter to be, in a sense, primarily heating. But through that heat passing through Jupiter, and here's where we do have to allow our minds to take a leap of imagination from the perspective of how Ptolemy thought and from the perspective of how he rationalized these things, that double heat that passed through the body of Jupiter began to melt some of the ice that we associate with Saturn. And because some of that ice that we associate with Saturn began to melt, that ice melting created a dropping of water or a precipitation in a sense. And that precipitation from the body of Saturn came down as a moisture that Jupiter also received within himself. Therefore, Jupiter becomes a body within our Chaldean order that isn't just hot by virtue of his relationship to Mars and the sun, but Jupiter is also moist by virtue of the way in which he melts some of that ice from Saturn from below and receives the effects of that melting. Now, everyone always asks at this exact moment, well, hey, if that's the case, how can we really say that Saturn has any ice to melt in the first place if Saturn is as far from the moon and the earth as possible? How can we think that Saturn has any moisture to precipitate from his body if he has no relationship to moisture at all by virtue of his distance from both the moon and the earth? And 
I really haven't heard anyone try to tackle this topic. And I also won't try to tackle the topic because I think that the larger point of this story that we get from Ptolemy is that this is the means by which the planets receive their natures. And this is the means by which we think of the planets in the way that we think about them today. And I think that more important than the quote unquote credibility of the story itself is the actual lesson to be learned in the story. And I think that there are a lot of, whether we call them myths or parables that truthfully, when we bring them down to a 3D level of consciousness, they don't actually bear the same level of accuracy in the real world. But in general, if we listen to the story for the moral within the story, or if we listen to the story for its instructional and its educational value, it does have a great deal of meaning. And as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about the story of the tortoise and the hare and how at the end of the race, the tortoise said, slow and steady wins the race as he raced in a sense against this rabbit. And we know that there isn't necessarily a tortoise and a hare that are communicating with each other and that are in any sort of a race with each other. But the overarching theme is what is the lesson there to be learned? So similarly, yes, Saturn is as far from the moon and the earth as possible, and therefore it doesn't have any moisture within himself. However, Ptolemy perceived Saturn as being an ice giant as a result of that. And Jupiter radiating onto Saturn, some of that double heat that Jupiter receives from the sun and Mars, melts some of that ice from Saturn and receives that ice as precipitation onto the body of Jupiter himself, making Jupiter hot and moist. Now, as we continue to come down our Chaldean order, the very next planet that we find is the sun. And we've already spoken about the sun and the nature of the sun being primarily hot and dry. And then we come down to Venus. Now, Venus is both very close to the sun as well as close enough to the earth in order for her to appropriate unto herself some of the moist vapors of the earth. Therefore, Venus was thought to be hot, but also she was thought to be moist by virtue of her relationship to not only the sun, but also the moon and the earth. So we find in Venus a similar set of qualities that we find in Jupiter. Venus is hot and moist for the same, well, not for the same reason, but Venus is hot and moist in much the same manner as Jupiter is hot and moist. So amongst those two planets, we find this central similarity. Similarly, we find the moon, if we recall earlier, the moon, according to Claudius Ptolemy, is also primarily moistening, but also heating. Therefore, the moon is also hot and moist within Ptolemy's doctrine. From Venus, we go down into the sphere or the shell of Mercury. Mercury is a bit of a weirdo from the perspective of Claudius Ptolemy. In Ptolemy's Tetra Biblos, we find a statement being said about Mercury that I have never seen repeated since. Actually, as I say that, I have seen it repeated in only one other source since Claudius Ptolemy. And I feel as if that source is Johannes Schoener, who was writing in the late medieval period. But I'm pretty sure that he was the one who reflected this piece that I'm about to share with you all from Ptolemy. This thing about Mercury is literally the source of everything that we find within Western occultism. This notion of the nature of Mercury is the very lifeblood of the school and the practice that we call alchemy, 
it is also the very lifeblood of the school and the practice of what we call hermeticism. And ultimately, what I'm about to tell you about Mercury is the very core of the body of practices that we call magic. Ptolemy says to us that Mercury is dry as a result of his proximity to the sun, as well as a result of the speed of his motion. However, Mercury also has the ability to be wet as a result of his proximity to the moon and the earth. As I say this, it gives me goosebumps because this is the key to the Western mystery tradition, that Mercury is both dry and wet. We do not see this occurring within any of the other planets. Within traditional astrology, hot and cold are thought to be agents, and wet and dry are thought to be patients. We never see two agents being together within the body of a single planet. And similarly, we never see two patients being together within the body of a single planet. So we don't have a planet that is hot and cold. However, we do have a planet that is wet and dry. Where this hits me in a spiritual way is something that's so overwhelming that it's actually difficult to articulate it into words, how profound this notion is that Mercury should be the only planet that has the ability to be both wet and dry. Mercury is the only planet that has the ability to be both a wave and a particle. Mercury is the only planet that has the ability to hold contradiction within himself without being destroyed by the sheer force of those contradictions. This is a profound esoteric secret that we find within the heart of our classical astrology, and it is something worth reclaiming. Now, the reason why I'm putting so much stress on this point about the nature of Mercury, for example, is because as we move from Claudius Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, and we move deeper into the Hellenistic period of astrology, as well as the later medieval period, and every period subsequent to that, essentially, we find some adaptations being made. And these adaptations that were made were not just made in relation to Mercury, but they were also made in relation to Venus, as well as to the moon. Within Ptolemy's system, we have Saturn as cold and dry, Jupiter as hot and moist, Mars as hot and dry, Sun as hot and dry, Venus as hot and moist, Mercury as wet and dry, and the moon as primarily moistening but also heating. However, we don't necessarily find any of these planets holding the final potential pairing that is possible which is the pairing of cold and moist. No planet is having these two pairs within its constitution when we read Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos. We find the other three pairs of hot and dry, cold and dry, hot and moist. And then in Mercury, the greatest mystery of all, we find the wet and the dry. But we don't find this final pairing which should be the cold and the moist. Astrologers writing after Ptolemy, assuming that Ptolemy possibly made a mistake in his attributions that he gave to the various planets, thought that Venus should be considered as cold and moist, that Mercury should be considered as cold and dry, and that the moon being the source of water from the perspective of this astrology, the moon, like water, should be considered to also be cold and moist. 
in doing that, one might imagine that they probably thought that they were bringing a sense of balance to Ptolemy's universe, or that they were bringing a sense of balance to the doctrine of Ptolemy. And I'm not necessarily sure if that's the reason why it was done, but the point is that it was done. And this, based on what I've shared with you thus far, we can see it, it actually doesn't make sense within the grander scheme of the unfolding of the planets, because if indeed the planetary natures are thought to proceed from their proximity to the sun, as well as to the moon-earth complex, then we can't really consider Venus to be cold and moist. We just can't, because Venus's proximity to the sun, like Mars's proximity to the sun, must demand that Venus has some share in the production of heat, that Venus herself is also hot. Similarly, the moon, based on Ptolemy's doctrine, is the consort of the sun, and the sun is also the consort of the moon, because there is no other planet within the sky that has the ability to rival the size of the sun in the same way that the moon can. Therefore, there is the sense of the moon receiving unto herself some of the power of the sun as being his consort. So the moon is not cold and moist, even though water over which the moon rules is cold and moist, even though the sign of the zodiac over which the moon rules is also cold and moist, that sign being cancer, the moon herself within Ptolemy's universe is not cold and moist. She is primarily moistening and also heating, which makes the moon a part of the group of planets to which Venus and Jupiter also belongs. And Mercury, the only reason why anyone thought to make Mercury cold and dry is because one of Mercury's two signs, which is Virgo, we know that Mercury rules two signs, Gemini and Virgo, one of Mercury's two signs, Virgo, is a sign that is cold and dry, like all the Earth signs are cold and dry. And Virgo also happens to be the exaltation of Mercury, which means that Mercury doesn't just have regular rulership in Virgo by being the landlord of Virgo, Mercury is also an honored guest. Mercury is also exalted when he is in Virgo, which is also the sign that belongs to him in general. Therefore, this doubling of the bounty of Mercury in the sign of Virgo is a part of why God knows who chose to give those qualities of cold and dry over to Mercury. However, this too is an error. And the reason why this is an error is because there's nothing about the nature of Mercury that is cold and dry. Cold and dry also corresponds with the element of Earth. And just to step back for a second, the four classical elements of fire, earth, air, and water take on these double qualities in the same way as the planets do. So the fire element is hot and dry. The earth element is cold and dry. The air element is hot and moist. The water element is cold and moist. So when we say that Mercury is cold and dry, we are essentially saying that Mercury is not only like Saturn, which we absolutely know is not the truth, but we're also saying that Mercury is like the element of Earth, which we absolutely know is not the truth. The very nature of Mercury is to be mercurial. And the very word mercurial means everything that is not grounded, everything that is not stable. To be mercurial is to be fickle, to be one way on one day and a completely different way another day. This whole concept of being mercurial is antithetical to the element of Earth. Therefore, we cannot, in good conscience, say that mercury is cold and dry, because in so doing, we are ultimately also saying that Mercury is like 
the element of the earth. And then Mercury is like Saturn, which we know as a point in fact is not the case. So when we think about Ptolemy saying that Mercury has the ability to be dry through his swiftness, but also when Mercury slows down, Mercury has the ability to be absolutely moist by virtue of his relationship to the moon and the earth, we find that that notion of Mercury is far more compatible with our understanding of how Mercury actually operates. Mercury the enigma, Mercury the chameleon, Mercury who is a masculine planet with masculine planets, a feminine planet with feminine planets, a good planet with good planets, a bad planet with bad planets, a daytime planet with daytime planets, a night nighttime planet with nighttime planets. No other sensible combination of two of these qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry can actually do justice to the knowledge that we have about how Mercury operates other than something as bizarre, as strange as this notion of Mercury being both wet as well as dry. And so this is why I think it's a very important thing for us to reclaim this doctrine of the seven classical planets, because when we have this understanding of how the seven classical planets are on this very baseline fundamental level, it can start to orient our minds as to why they operate in the ways that they do. And it can also help us come into an understanding and an awareness about how we can view these planets, not just from the outside in, but how we can also start to view these planets from the interiority of these planets to the outside. Because that is what we find within traditional astrology. We find an understanding of the internal operation of things on their own terms. And from that understanding of who the planets are intrinsically, we can better understand how to coordinate our lives in relationship to them and also how to better interpret how they operate when we bring them down to the realm of our actual practice of astrology. I hope that you all enjoyed this lecture today. This is part one of this lecture series regarding the planets because within Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, he also goes on to talk about why some planets are benefic planets or doers of good, as well as why some planets are malefic planets or doers of evil. And then he goes on to talk about why some planets are masculine and other planets are feminine. And then he goes on to talk about why some planets are diurnal and other planets nocturnal. And I really would love to dive deeply into all of that with you all in the next few videos in this series. And as always, if you want to dive more deeply into these studies with us at Oraculos, this is really just the tip of the iceberg of what we actually do. And if you are curious or hungry at this point to learn so much more about these topics, then please feel free to sign up for our upcoming Foundations of Classical Astrology program, which begins this fall 2022. The Foundations of Classical Astrology program is where you learn all the things you could possibly need to know in order to master traditional astrology in a practical and a concrete way. And this doctrine of the planets is a part of that curriculum. So if you want to dive more deeply into becoming not just an extraordinary astrologer, but also an astrologer well-versed in the doctrine and the philosophy upon which astrology is built, then please, by all means, check out our website at www.oraculosastrology.com so that you can become a part of our Oraculos family today.
All right, so as always, I make these videos through the support of my entire family of students over at the Oracular School of Astrology. So today's lecture is being done, as always, in front of a quote-unquote live studio audience, and I would love to take any questions at this time that you may have in relationship to what we spoke about today. So this isn't exactly a, I don't know what the question would be, but it was kind of like an epiphany that I feel like it opened up a whole big space of something I need to think about where you just said Mercury is warm with a warm planet, cold with a cold planet, uh, wet with a wet planet, dry with a dry planet. And I, boy, I really got to think about that and the symbolism of all the alignments and that just makes Mercury, I, I don't know. And you know what you said about it being the central theme. I wish you'd say a little bit more about that. Mm. You know, this whole Mercury notion is a huge part of everything that we do at Oraculos. And I think that that's manifested through how I teach astrology at Oraculos, but it's also manifested through the other topics that we teach at Oraculos as well, such as the Kabbalistic Tarot and Hermeticism and Chiromancy and all of these adjuncts of the Western mystery tradition, because all of these topics fall under the dominion of Mercury, not just Mercury as a god, but also Mercury as a concept or as the representation of a concept. And Mercury within the Tarot, if we were to talk about that for a bit, corresponds with the magician card and the magician card has everything to do about standing in the gap or about standing in that middle space between super consciousness and subconsciousness and creating a world by way of magic and so when we think about Mercury as a planet and as a concept Mercury represents all the ways in which these practices of astrology or tarot or chiromancy or any magical thing we do, Mercury really represents all the ways in which these practices allow each of us to stand in that gap of intercession between superconsciousness and subconsciousness. It represents the ways in which these practices allows all of us to be the messengers of the gods. Because that is also the role that Mercury held in just classical mythology in general, that Mercury or Hermes was considered to be the messenger of the gods. Thoth or Tehuti in ancient Egypt was considered to be the scribe of the gods. So there's this very real way in which Mercury serves as the bridge between the heavens and the earth. And even when we think about some of the myths surrounding Mercury and the story of Persephone, for example, and the abduction of Persephone by Hades, we find that Mercury was the only god who was able to go down into the underworld and rescue her from there. So not only does Mercury have the ability to be the intercessor or the bridge between the heavens and the earth, Mercury also has the ability to be the bridge between the earth, the heavens, and the underworld. So this notion of Mercury being able to become all things is a very big part of our astrology because ultimately our astrology is meant to cast us into a very dichotomized version of the world. But the part of us that is mercurial is meant to teach us that even within that notion of ourselves, within a very dualistic world, we still have the ability to become all things. Even if we can't become all things on a physical level, from a spiritual perspective, from the part of ourselves that is non-physical, we have no actual limitations. We can become anything insofar as we can use the mercurial part of ourselves, our mind, to imagine a world for us or to imagine a new way of being in the world around us. And that's purely a mercurial function. And so for me, Mercury is really the point of everything, that everything that we do on an esoteric level or an occult level 
or a spiritual level, all of these practices are meant to make us become more like Mercury. They're all meant to make us be able to hold contradictions within ourselves without being completely destroyed by those contradictions. And that's something that comes through time and that comes through practice and that comes through experience. But ultimately, all spiritual paths uh, speak about there being a version of reality that exists beyond duality or that exists beyond dualism. And Mercury is actually the only symbol of that that we find within a traditional astrological context. Yeah, I can see that. I also kind of get the idea that Mercury is a little bit like the people pleaser, that if Mercury is aligned with Saturn, depending on the strength of Saturn and the aspects to Saturn, he's going to try to suck up to Saturn and do his tricks in a way that pleases Saturn. And likewise, every other planet that he might be aligned with, right? Well, I think the big thing in terms of Mercury is that Mercury is less a people's pleaser and more a mirror. And I think that a part of our notion of Mercury as being a trickster per se has nothing to do with Mercury himself, even though a classical mythology is rife with examples of Mercury the trickster. But I think at a deeper esoteric level, Mercury isn't actually a trickster. Mercury is a mirror. And in general, we all have had an experience of walking past mirror and having some understanding of who we are that probably is less than supportive of who we think we should be. And so we all have this experience of mirrors playing games with us or our projection of ourselves onto mirrors being the thing that's actually playing games with us. Whereas the mirror itself continues to remain an impartial reflection. So when we see Mercury in aspect with other planets, what we often find is an impartial reflection of that planet themselves, as if that planet has the ability to express itself in a way that's unobstructed by way of the mirror that Mercury represents. And this is also something that we find through the sun and the moon as well, because the sun and the moon usually by themselves, and I think probably the sun more than the moon, but the sun and the moon usually by themselves are reflective of whatever they are in combination with. And this we find coming up within the Renaissance period where the sun, moon, and Mercury are thought to operate in this manner of reflection, whereas we understand them more fully based on where they are and the planets that they're in aspect with. But at the end of the day, insofar as Mercury is concerned, I think that Mercury really stands as the pure mirror out of all of them. And we know that there has even been a human tradition of making mirrors using the metal that we call Mercury because of its reflective properties. So I think that Mercury is more of a mirror than Mercury has ever been a trickster per se. And I think that it is that part of us within us that can sometimes be uncomfortable with ourselves that makes us feel as if Mercury is playing tricks when in fact Mercury is really just reflecting whatever environment it finds itself in, in the most impartial way possible. And that too, I think, is a part of the mystery that we ascribe to Mercury. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's episode of Mastering Traditional Astrology. It has truly been a pleasure for me to share these teachings with you, and I really hope that you've gotten something from it. So once again, if you've enjoyed today's episode of Mastering Traditional Astrology, then by all means, subscribe to the Oraculos podcast if you haven't subscribed already, as well as hit the notification bell so that you can find out when we come out with more and more of these episodes, which we plan to make a weekly commitment and as always, share this episode with your other astrologically and magically minded friends, because we feel like more people can benefit from hearing about this information. Also, please make sure that you check out our website to check out our upcoming Hori Astrology Intensive, which begins June 11, 2022, as well as our Natal Astrology Intensive, 
which begins July 23rd, 2022. And definitely, if you haven't checked out our Foundations of Classical Astrology program, check out FOCA, which begins fall 2022. So there are so many opportunities for you to continue to study with us here at Oraculos, and we hope to see you taking advantage of all of them. Until next time, have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you.